Welcome back to Here at Goldberg. Today we'll be talking about how much money do you really need to make it in the United States? Because I believe there's much statistical magic being worked just to gaslight people into thinking it's better than it actually happens to be. And so here we have a salary you need to be considered middle class in every U.S. state. It's close to 200K in two of them. All right. California, middle class income range, 61 to 183. This is what I'm talking about. And 183 in most parts of California would maybe make you just about lower middle class, but 61,000 is not middle class. See, they'll say, well, but if you live this part of the state, you can't escape state taxes though, for the most part. You can't escape federal taxes, even these limited governments, counties, they will still do that. They might not increase the tax rate on property, but they will just assess the value higher. So you get taken either way. Florida, maybe in the middle of that range, you'd be closer to middle class. Hawaii, 63,000, not even close. Illinois, 52,000, once more, not even close. Maryland, 65,000. Get the hell out of here. You are not middle class making 65K anywhere in the DC area. That's a big freaking cope. Same thing with Massachusetts. New York, 54,000. <laughs> Never forget how readily they will try to lie to you when it comes to this statistical nonsense. And it's been going on for some time. In fact, I can recall doing a video discussing whether you can actually retire on a million realistically and people were getting butt hurt and saying, no, you can. And they don't understand that the rate of inflation, it's becoming pretty much unrealistic. Unsurprisingly, now they say Americans don't think they need to be millionaires in order to achieve financial success. One reason may be because it doesn't go as far as it used to due to the depreciating value of money over time. Oh, really genius. Millionaires might not be considered as wealthy as they used to be. 50 years ago in 74, it was 1 million. It has the same buying power as 6 million today. 6 million, exactly. And I remember getting grief for saying 3 million is maybe a little bit more reasonable. And that was probably four or five years ago. 60% of Americans say they would feel financially successful if they're able to live comfortably. That means being able to afford day-to-day -day expenses while putting money into savings. Yeah, but that implies that you're going to just keep working, right? How are you going to retire? And so maybe that's why in the past you had to have more kids, you live with them, you don't have your retirement house per se. There's a lot of things that just don't make sense here. Salary is often not the best barometer for financial success. No, but it's easy to play that whole thing of, I'm not keeping up with the Joneses. But even if you aren't, even if you're one of the Clarences, you still have to deal with the reality that a lot of expenses are built in. And if you're trying to take care of yourself and you say, but I'm going to be a minimalist, you may be doing yourself a disservice. It depends. We'll talk about that a little bit later on in the video. And then we have this story. 40-year-old delivers for DoorDash to help pay down her 100,000 student loan debt on top of her full-time job. Only in America, uh, these headlines. Or maybe not. Shanita Leslie has always had a passion for education, but by the time she earned her bachelor's degree in sociology, master's of education in psychology with a concentration in school counseling in 2009, her student loan debt had ballooned to around 101,000 and she was struggling to make payments. Now, I know you're going to say, why didn't she do STEMer trades? But why are basic jobs that exist because of the structure of the economy, why are they so expensive to get into? They're saying that now at 40 years old, she's making 65K as a full-time program manager, part-time DoorDash driver, and freelance writer. And you're like, really? Is this why maybe people aren't having kids? I mean, it's also cultural. You can't break it down to cost of living too much. But I think psychologically speaking, burdening people with a bunch of debt that they're carrying into middle age is not exactly encouraging them to pop out a couple of, you know, trad kids or whatever you want to call it. She moves to Houston and was welcomed with open arms. I absolutely love it here.
Although Leslie has been chipping away at her student loan debt for about 15 years, she says it's been worth it in order to pursue her passion. This is the work I love, she says. I love giving people information that I didn't have. Yet yeah, you think? This is tragic in multiple ways. And then, so the only reason she got to this position is because Uncle Joey forgave 60000 in federal loans. I was completely relieved, she says, but she still had 40000 balance, so she had to pay that off doing DoorDash. Again, I mean, you can say whatever you want. That's the cost of success. It just seems totally ridiculous that people at middle age, they're making this amount of money, working all those hours simply to be debt free. Like something doesn't quite click here. And then she lives without a car. Now this is her monthly budget. Housing and utilities, 1400. That actually seems pretty cheap for Houston. I wonder if she's in a bad neighborhood. Insurance, 600. Discretionary, 436. And then subscriptions and memberships, which breaks down to Jim and Hulu. I imagine that's got to be one of those specialty gyms like Booty Pop or whatever, because a gym, I pay $30 a month, which I think is a little bit excessive, although the gym is sizable. It has a pool, that kind of thing. So you're not limited just simply. Like, that's the reason I don't like Planet Fitness, because the only one that's close by to me, I can only really tell you're going to go in there at the wrong time and you're going to have to wait for freaking 20 minutes while some freaking boomer clown is hogging one machine and then trying to do two at the same time. Yeah, screw all that. But it, it just seems, honestly, on her budget, these don't, things don't seem excessive except for the gym dynamic. And that's something I wanted to point out that people will talk about being minimalist, but when you really start trying to cut it's more difficult than folks might imagine if you're, and I'm not just talking about keeping up with the Joneses, I'm talking about taking care of yourself. It goes to my longstanding opinion that the whole fire movement, your money or your life, which was popularized in the late nineties, it was designed for those who are already making decent money. It's not about regular folks because there was no way as wage growth has been largely stagnant. There is no scenario where regular types who still are going to try to have a family, something like that. We're going to be able to do fire. And then the one dude who was all wrapped up in fire, Mr. Money Mustache, he got divorced. So that didn't exactly help. But you have these types that will wander into these spaces. And I don't know if it's because they are just in that ideal IQ range where they can do well at a corporation. They can make high bucks and they're just aloof and have no self-awareness. Or perhaps they're just totally ignorant or arrogant. They want to be, you know, they want to have someone jerk them off, but they'll enter into these spaces trying to get advice. So called, I remember years ago, probably 15 years, my dad was listening to this financial radio program and the guy calls in and says, so he had retired as an army officer. And then he had done 20 or 25 years as a public school teacher. His combined pensions were 125, 130,000 a year. Not to mention what he had, 401k, savings, and he was going, hey, do you think I'm going to be able to retire? Can I afford, is this enough money to retire? It's like, dude, are you for real? Or this story right here, and this is, or post, I should say, 2014. So this money was worth a lot more at that time. And this is a young couple, early 30s. They have a beautiful old home, 130 years old, and they're not sure if they can afford the project of enhancing it. So it's a 250K valued house, 30 year mortgage with 190K balance on it. And they're making 400,000 a year, plus or minus 100K. So at least 300,000 a year. And they're not sure if they can afford to do a remodel. Budgeting certainly helps, but as I've found, it's only to a certain degree. So once you buy a house, even if you're trying your best to keep things low, you know, don't leave lights on, don't take long showers, you're going to be charged a certain figure each month for utilities regardless. You've got insurance on the house. If you want to make any enhancements, we're talking about a minimum of typically like 10,000, 20,000, sometimes 30,000. They say, well, just do it yourself. There are some things you can do yourself. There's other things if you don't have a specific skill set, like you haven't actually been a tradesman in that, it's a little bit uh, questionable and gnarly whether you want to actually get into it just using YouTube. Uh, trust me, I know because I've tried it before. And then just general lifestyle stuff. So for instance, I could probably cut maybe $100 a month in expenses if I stopped taking supplements, 
which then you say, are they good for your health? Are they not? There's debates over that. I could get rid of my gym membership and just work out at home. Although you don't have the same ability to hit certain muscle groups. If you're not, you don't have access to all those machines and weights, you can do some stuff, but it's going to be relatively limited. And I could, I have an additional cell phone, which is a piece of garbage anyway. So I could get rid of that phone plan. So that would save some, but stuff that is pretty much, I don't have much control over at this stage, you know, gas costs, car repairs, because cars in general, they're not designed to go more than probably 10 or 11,000 miles a year. If you're getting up to 20, 30, you're going to end up with a lot of uh, repairs on a regular basis. It's inevitable. So if I got a remote job, it would help a little bit, but would I be making the same amounts? Would I have the same ideal setup? Because that's the other thing I spend not a ton of money on the research. I can get a lot of stuff at the two libraries nearby. Uh, I try to do eBooks a lot. Sometimes, you know, 600 page book, you're like, yeah, I'd rather have it in hand. I can move through it faster and it's not going to kill my eyes being on a screen the entire time. So these are things that they end up being kind of, and that's, that's more of a hobby, like an enjoyment thing, but that's the point. If you want to reward yourself at all, if you want to take vacations, that's even more on top of it. And that's something that's more of discretionary. But then do you want to just work your ass off, never take a trip, never do anything because, well, I'm, I need to be a minimalist? I suspect it's for precisely this reason that I have some reticence to engage in the classic content where it's just, you know, be a good goober, pay your bills, do that, do this. Because on the one hand, you have to watch these clowns that are investing in like a GameStop or some random crypto and making tons of money doing practically nothing. And you're at the grind constantly or don't get into debt, but that's another dynamic. We have this debt aversion. Oftentimes upper middle class people and rich people, certainly they might die in debt, but if you know how to manage and structure debt, it can work to your advantage. Whereas if you're super fixated on, you can never have anything that's a liability of that sort, it might prevent you from building wealth. I remember that guy, Victor Pride would attack people and say, if you start a business, you should have no debt. And then he would also claim he bought a bunch of real estate. It's like, well, dude, how are you freaking affording real estate without debt? You either had a high end job, i.e. not like teaching English in Asia, or you inherited money or you, you know, won out with some kind of lottery or crypto thing, but this is pre crypto. So they are always telling you don't get into debt, but it's not so much the debt. It's how you manage the debt, how strategic you are with it. And I understand that kind of the, the Sam Hyde argument, I think Western decline was talking about something similar where maybe you just take out these loans and disappear overseas. Like Lux Maximus did. I I'm, I don't know about the United States. I still feel there's gotta be some contingent where they can track you down and arrest you. Although I could be wrong on that. Canada is likely to be more on the, uh, more flexible, but yeah, some people are just advocating, take a bunch of money, go overseas, live a good life. You know, don't be stuck in the grind set because you're just pissing away much of your existence and you're never really able to get ahead. I mean, I would say for myself, I'm doing well, but an extra 50, 60 K a year would be desirable just to be able to have more margin because then you have these expenses that come up and you just, oh my God, you know, another massive thing, another depletion of your account. You just have to hope that the cost you do recoup at some point particularly if it's like a housing improvement, but it is rough. So I just want to, everyone let me know, I mean, if you're willing to, how much money you're making, what part of the country, and do you really feel that you are thriving or are you just kind of getting by? And what I mean by that, can you still kind of enjoy your existence, do stuff you want, or are you sort of constrained based upon how much money you make, or at least the prevailing costs, courtesy of uh, Donald Trump and Joey Biden?